morning everyone. In the midst of this heat wave or the three day summer, we extend a very warm welcome to you as we gather to worship Almighty God this morning. Uh, and as we come at the outset of our uh, service, I have uh, some announcements to bring to your attention. Uh, can the members of Kirk Session remember that we have a meeting planned for tomorrow night at 8pm. That's just to uh, update ourselves uh, on our walks uh, and to further plan uh, for the autumn. Uh, then members of the church committee, uh, as announced last Sunday, if they could just wait for a few moments uh, after church this morning, that would be appreciated. And then for the whole congregation, just to highlight and to remind you of our leaflets, uh, highlighting our forest walks. So the first walk is to Drumnaff Wood, and that's on Wednesday the 27th of July. Uh, the uh, leaflet itself gives the location and directions to each of the venues that we're covering. There are three venues in total over the summer, uh, and the walks are starting at 7 p.m. And at each walk, uh, we're having a, a special speaker. And as we uh, seek to connect with our church family, uh, we are seeking to connect with people of all ages. So uh, the, first, the first talk uh, on the providence of nature, so it's a short, it's a short uh, talk uh, as part of a walk, will be from George Barclay, and George is from Ramblestown. George puts up uh, video talks or YouTube talks um, about nature and about farming and different things. So he will refer to the providence of nature in the first talk. And then the second talk is High and Mighty, and it's in Moidama. And all being well, uh, we have um, participants from the Commonwealth, two participants from the Commonwealth Games at that event, or possibly at that stage, there could be medal winners. Uh, so we'll, we'll let you know of them uh, closer to the time. But just take a leaf it and share and invite uh, so that this is an opportunity for us as a congregation and with our friends uh, to come along and to share some time together and give some uh, valuable exercise. Today we're moving through uh, Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 12. We're going to be thinking about tricky questions about how uh, two groups came and posed uh, tricky questions to Jesus to try and trip them up. Uh, and no doubt those uh, that profess the Christian faith will have come across people that want to ask these tricky questions in life to try and trip us up in our faith, to try and undermine us, uh, and ultimately to try uh, and disprove God. So the Bible talks a lot uh, about the words that we use, the questions that we ask, and our attitude to God. So let's turn in our call to worship to Isaiah. Chapter 29 and verses 13 to 16. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on mere human rules they have been taught. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, Who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down, as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, You did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, You know nothing? And in our study of God's word, we'll see how many of those things spoken by the prophet Isaiah came true as the Pharisees and as the Herodians came to try and trick and to trap Jesus in what they thought were their intelligent and smart questions. Our opening praise is found in Mission Praise. It's number 680. There's a song for all the children. Let's stand to praise God. Thank you.
with all of your, your, your favourite pet. And, and I'm sure you love to hear stories uh, about animals and about, about pets. Well, this, this story about the pony with good habits is a story uh, about the pet that belonged to a butcher and it's about an animal. Many years ago in England, there was a man who was a butcher. And at the time he lived, he had a butcher's round. Now, it was before supermarkets. Uh, so the butcher went around and he would have delivered meat to your home. You could have got the items just like as you can today. You can order a carry out and you can have it delivered to your doorstep. Well, the butcher then, at that time, he went around each week delivering meat to his customers at their houses. This meant that the butcher had a list of houses and he would go along each week to them with his pony and cart and supply them, sell them meat. In those days, it was just before they were starting to use cars. And so the pony and cart were common on the streets and they were used to do this type of work. But one day, the butcher took on well. The butcher was sick. And the butcher couldn't go to work. He says, I can't. I can't go and sit in that car. I'd fall off. I'm so sick and I'm so weak. So he decided that he would need to do something about it. And, and before, before he was able to come up with a solution, there, there was another shopkeeper who, who was a friend. And he says, look, I, I'll help you out. I've got a young fella that's working for me and I can spare him to you for a couple of days. So, the butcher thought, well, that's a good idea. That will take care of a tight spot. So, this young shop assistant came along and his name was Gary. And, and the butcher was delighted when Gary turned up and came along to deliver his meat to his customers. But on the other hand, Gary just wasn't so pleased because he didn't know the village that well. He didn't know where all the people lived. And he thought, this is going to become a mess. I'm going to get a pound of mince and a pound of sausages mixed up in the wrong houses and people are going to be shouting and roaring at me because I didn't do the right thing. But the, the butcher spoke to Gary and he says, Gary, there's the list of customers and there's the list of meat that each customer has to get. And he says, Gary, don't you panic. Just calm down. I'll tell you what to do. He says, I have given you the list, I have sorted out the meat, so it's all in the right order. You get on the car and you tell the pony to get in. And the pony will go. And whenever it stops, you go to the nearest house and deliver the first piece of meat. And then work down your list until you're ready for it. And so Gary thought, well, okay, all right, we'll give that a go and see what happens. And so Gary set off, and the, the pony, sure enough, went down the road, went round the circle. He stopped, they gave out the meat, came back on, and Gary was smiling from cheek to cheek. He says, that was a great idea. He says, the pony stopped, the pony knew to stop at each house, and I was able to go and give out the meat. And you see, the pony hadn't forgotten what it had learned. It had formed this habit of going around each day and doing this circuit and stopping at the houses. And it knew which house to stop at because it had formed a good habit. And that good habit paid off for Gary because the pony was able to go around its calls and homes and he was able to deliver meat. And so boys and girls and young people, it's important for us to form the right habits and it's easy to form the right habits or it's easier to form the right habits whenever we are young and habits are things that once you keep repeating they stick with you uh, and some of us have habits sometimes they're good and the other time it's a bad habit uh, and we tend to keep them as we grow up but what what good habits does God want us to have 
As we grow up, God wants us to be in the habit of reading our Bible. And God wants us to be in the habit of not only reading our Bible, but putting into practice, obeying what the Bible says to us. God also would want us to get into a good habit of praying to him each day. And God also wants us to get into the habit, just like many people have been coming in the habit of coming here to church for many, many years. God wants you to form that habit so that in your life you will come to church, you will come to Sunday school, but if you're young, you grow up and into church week by week. But also, uh, as we'll discuss with the older folks later on in our reading this morning, God wants us to learn good habits and put into practice what God's Word is saying. God wants us to learn to give to others. And sometimes we give our time, and sometimes we give our money. So if you've got pocket money, or you're, you're working like, like Gary was, and if you're working an evening or a day of the week, it's good to learn the habit tithing and giving some of that to God. Because whenever you grow older, there's a man called the tax man. And he will come and he will ask you to give him some of that money. So if you're used in the habit of giving to others, and then whenever it comes to giving to the tax man, it'll come that wee bit easier. So ask God to help you boys and girls and young people to form good habits in your life, and if you form good habits, they'll stand you in good stead through life. Thank you. Now let's turn to our mission praise 247. As we reflect on the joy of coming to God's house week by week, as we reflect on the privilege of learning from His Word, as we sing the words, How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me.
Let's open up our Bibles at page 1017 as we turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 12 and we read from verse 13 uh, through to verse 27. Uh, and really the, the two groups are coming uh, with two trick questions. Firstly about the paying taxes to Caesar and secondly uh, about a lady who had been married a number of times and a question to do with marriage and the resurrection. And so hence that idea of forming a good habit to learn to give to Almighty God and to learn to give back uh, to the government. So let's start with verse 13. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by them because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But you, Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me in the nearest and let me look at it. They brought a coin and they asked him, Whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Then the Sadducees, who said there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife with no children, the man must marry the widow of the children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no children. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife would she be since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, Are you not in her because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses and the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. And we pray for God to bless this reading of scripture to us this morning. Let's come again uh, to our God as we pray to him, as we give thanks and as we pray for others. Almighty God, we bow before you and we're thankful, Lord, for the blessings that you have given to us. Lord, we're thankful for those who have taught us to form good habits. Lord, we thank you for that habit of bringing to you an offering out of our possessions and blessings to give back to you to show our appreciation and our thanksgiving. And so we pray, Lord, that you would accept our gifts and bring your blessing to them. Father, we pray for those who are ill, those, Lord, who are in hospital or have been in hospital in recent days, and we ask that your healing hand would be near to them, that their body may know improvement in health and strength. Lord God, as we pray, we remember those who have become uh, disconnected from our congregation, from our worship, uh, and Lord, those who are disconnected from God. And we pray, Father, that uh, through uh, our plans to have walks uh, and talks, uh, that as folks have the opportunity of walking along familiar, Lord, or maybe unknown tracks of forest and countryside, that they would have the opportunity to talk one with another. Lord, they would have the opportunity to hear from a guest. Lord, we pray that you would bless those gatherings, that they would be a help and a means to rebuilding congregational connections, Lord. We pray that you would give us the encouragement uh, to invite those who uh, belong to our congregation and those who don't normally worship with us. We pray, Father, that this may build bridges and that this may prepare a way as we start for a new season of worship in September. 
Lord, we ask that you be with the speakers and pray that you would guide and direct them as they prepare their talks, as they prepare the message that you would have them bring to us. Father, within the subject of giving and of taxes, we, we come and pray for our government. We pray, Lord, for the Conservative Party as they seek to elect uh, a new uh, leader. Uh, and that leader will then become the new Prime Minister. Uh, and we're very conscious that in the past days, Lord, those who have made their pitch uh, to be the Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister uh, have had much to say about taxation, about the taxes they would like to reduce. So, Father, we know that uh, these words of Scripture are very real and very relevant to us. And so we ask that you would guide us in the payment of taxes. Lord, we pray that uh, as none of us really want to give away money in taxation, that you'd help us to see the benefit. And Lord, that you would help us uh, to be honest uh, in what we owe to the government. And to understand, Lord, that taxation is necessary. And taxation is used when property government and steward over for the good of the nation. Father, we pray for those who are absent uh, due to holidays. We ask, Lord, that you may be near to them and bless them. Uh, Father, that they may be able to enjoy the weather and the time of refreshment. And Father, for those who come to admire the beauty of our mountains and our countryside uh, and to see the, the difference and variety of life in our towns and villages. We pray for blessing upon them as they come amongst us. Lord, we pray that it may be those who would come amongst us to worship on your name. These things we bring to your throne of grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to the words of Mission Praise 769. Who is on the Lord's side? Where we discover that those who came to question Jesus were not on his side. They were depending on their intelligence and their wisdom to try and catch Jesus out. So we say and we ask ourselves the question, who is on the Lord's side?
today as we turn to this passage in chapter 12 we're going to think about trick questions many of you as we said will encounter uh, tricky questions those questions that seem to be difficult or sometimes there are people who can ask questions that seem to be impossible to answer uh, these people that turned up uh, to face Jesus thought that they were so smart that they could outwit him by asking these trick questions. In reality, since Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the tension with the religious leaders has been rising stage by stage and day by day. These religious leaders are growing in frustration because they've been unsuccessful thus far in challenging the authority of Jesus. And so their next tactic in trying to trick and to trap Jesus in his own words is to send a series of delegations to meet Jesus with the intent of tying him in knots. Their aim is firstly to turn the crowd against him and ideally to turn the Roman authorities against him. That the first group will they appear on the scene they're all pent up they think they've got the question that's going to be able to trick in Jesus it's a political question and what better way to raise tensions what better way is to start around than to ask a political question to deal with the subject of politics and so we could say the first trick question was political. Now, there was a group of Pharisees, a group of Herodians. They were most likely from the ruling body called the Sanhedrin. It was the Supreme Council. It was the tribunal of the Jews during post-exilic times. It was headed by a high priest. It had religious, civil and criminal jurisdiction amongst the Jews. So these folks are sent to Jesus to attempt to trick and to trap him in his answer. Now, as we think about these groups, we discover that this is a bit of an unholy alliance between the Pharisees and between the Herodians, who, despite being religious leaders, had really very little in common. It was a bit like a coalition government. They were all shades of opinion but they came together as part of the ruling authority. And anyone will know that where you've got a coalition government, you've got these tensions, you've got this sway of trying to keep people happy, of trying to keep a stable government, of trying to keep yourself in power. So these people endured each other as part of that gathering that ruled over the Jews at that time, this coalition of leaders. The Pharisees on the one hand, well they were the religious purists of their day and they despised Roman rule. The Pharisees were regarded as being the conservative party of the small C, um, as being highly respectable but also highly legalistic. They were big on their rules and their instructions and their laws that had to be obeyed to the letter of the word. They enjoyed their power. They enjoyed getting respect and accolades from the people as they moved about the market, as they went about their activities in Jerusalem. On the other hand, very little is known about the group called the Herodians, but as their name suggests, they aligned themselves with the ruler called Herod, and therefore they were likely seen as religious and political compromisers. Far from despising Roman rule, the Herodian rulers were, some would say, being propped up by the Romans. The Romans could see the advantage of having these supporters in the ruling coalition. That they could get a word in, they, they, they would have feedback of what the Jews were thinking and what was going on. These Herodians, they would support the various Herods uh, who ruled and encouraged other Jews to do the same, to get behind Rome and support this invading power. Perhaps they also viewed Jesus and what he had to say as being a threat 
to the stability of the Roman rule because his popularity was growing and the rumours were circulating that he said he was going to be a king. And if you remember back at the time of the birth of Jesus, Herod the Great and all the male babies in Jerusalem killed in Bethlehem area, killed before it in an attempt to prevent Jesus surviving and from taking the kingdom of Herod. The Herodians likely would have followed a similar policy by allying themselves against any possible rival to the throne, to the Roman authority. And so, as we see with the Pharisees and the Herodians, they had very little in common, but one thing they didn't have in common, one thing that brought them together was their hatred of this man, Jesus. Interestingly, when they arrive with Jesus, they don't show that off. That they, they start to butter Jesus up. They, they talk to him so sweetly and, and so nicely. Teacher, we know that you are true. Teacher, we know you don't care about anyone's opinion. You're not swayed by how people look at you or what they say. You will tell the truth. They were filled with flattery for Jesus. And it's a warning for all of us because it's nice to hear people say nice things about you, isn't it? But often people who say nice things about you often say them because they're looking for something in return. They're looking for a favour or they're looking for you to do something. But the Bible tells us in Proverbs and Job to beware of people who bring words of flattery. But instead, we are to pray for discernment, to understand the truth of what people are saying, rather than letting our vanity and our ego swell our heads and take us over. It's very good to truthfully compliment an individual for what they've done. But when we do it for a selfish motive, then it's a false compliment. It becomes dishonest and it's deceitful. So interestingly, these uh, folks that gather observe the depth of the character of Jesus. And ironically, they feel to take that into consideration when they have met with him. They say all these nice things, they try to butter him up, but they don't really mean it. Jesus wouldn't be swayed by these fine words anyway. They knew that, and Jesus knew that, so why did they do it? Who's to know? So they lay, they lay a potentially divisive political question at the feet of Jesus. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? How more direct, how more blunt can you get than that? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? That's a question in 14. Should we pay or should we pay? And this is a question that most likely even the Pharisees themselves, this group that were asking the question, weren't agreed on. They probably disagreed on what the answer should be. And since the religious authorities had failed to discredit Jesus outright, they now attempt to turn the people against him on this question of taxation. As we've been praying, the Conservative Party in the leadership campaign, they know how sensitive taxation is. They know that if you do it the right way, you can get a good buzz out of it, i.e. if you're reducing tax. And they know on the other hand, if you're putting tax up, you're going to have a negative impact, you're going to turn people off. It was no different in the time of Caesar and the time of Jesus. So what's Jesus got to say? If Jesus says, yes, you should pay the taxes, well, the people are going to be a bit browned off. If he says no, well then the Romans were going to have him arrested. Many Jews at that time, just like us, wouldn't have been too keen on paying taxes. They would have been, maybe, even can we say, against paying taxes. And besides the fact that people are normally against paying taxes, there were, there were many more reasons. Because at that time, Rome was the occupying force in that area of Jerusalem and Palestine. Rome was viewed as being 
evil, it was pagan. It was a nation who worshipped the selection of false gods. And if, if the Pharisees could just get Jesus to publicly state his opposition to paying taxes, they would have a strong reason to accuse him before the Romans. They could label Jesus as a revolutionary, that they could hang him out as a rebel who preached against the Romans. They could say that he was stirring up trouble. He was leading the nation away from Roman rule and their authority. And there would have been plenty of witnesses to bear that out. It was the height of hypocrisy. These leaders sought any chance to accuse Jesus. Publicly they attended or they pretended to be pro-Roman. And yet they were about to accuse Jesus of the very things that they themselves supported. Uh, and you can just imagine every muscle in, the, in their body trying to keep calm and not reveal the grin behind their question, their plan to trick Jesus. Outwardly, they look proper and sincere, upright and religious. They look as if they're eager to learn from the questions they asked. But inwardly, their hearts were desperately hoping Jesus would slip on the banana skin political question. And Jesus, he sees right through their plan. Why do you put me to the test, he says in verse 15. Why are you trying to trap me? He says, bring, bring me a, a coin, bring me a denarius to have a look at and I'll answer your question. And Jesus, now in possession of the coin, asks his interviewers, he answers the question with the question. He says, whose likeness, whose inscription is on this coin that I hold in my hand? To which they respond in verse 16, Caesar's, they replied. And Jesus brilliantly answers their question. He says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. We find the answer in verse 17. We learn from this verbal exchange that Jesus is willing to address this political question. We learn that he's willing to address political topics. And sometimes, sometimes the church, sometimes individual Christians, can make one or two mistakes in this whole area of politics. On the one hand, we can completely avoid any topic or any issue that seems to have political overtones, and we say, no, no, that's not for us to get involved in. And there are times when we aren't silent, and we should be. Perhaps the people then and now, they were afraid of being labelled as political. We, we still live in a, a, a pretty politically divisive world. If we want to start a row, we can ask a good political question today. And so when it comes to dealing with those topics that are deemed to be political, it, it's good to remember that we are to be gracious. It's good to remember that we are measured as we engage in political issues. And there are times, there are times when we must, as God's people, as his disciples, we must engage with the politics of the day. There are some uh, Christians and they believe it is their calling in life to serve the people as politicians at various strands of government, whether that be uh, in politics, a local council, uh, in Stormont or in Westminster, uh, those who believe they are called in to work in the civil service, all in the realm of politics. They go about seeking to influence for the glory of God. But whenever it comes to political issues, there, there is that mixing of topics that the church has something to say, the Holy Scripture has something to say. There's something to be said about abortion and the legislation around it. There's something to be said about sexuality, about the meaning of marriage, about human rights, about poverty. And if Jesus wasn't silent as he ministered, neither should we be. But Jesus valued spiritual things 
above the earthly things. We could say, well, was Jesus pro or anti Roman? And interestingly, we can read through all of the Gospels, and we find that Jesus never talked about it one way or the other unless he was first asked the question. There were many Jews and they were preoccupied by this debate, but Jesus avoided it. Jesus knew that spiritual things were far more important, far more urgent than these earthly questions. And the fact is that a political party is not on its own going to solve all our problems. The fact is that the economic approach of communism or capitalism will not bring us into a paradise or a utopia. The bottom line is that as human beings we are sinful. And if we trust parties, if we trust political systems, if we trust economic systems, then we will end up being disappointed. And yet, as God's people, while we are in this world, we are called to be a good witness. We're called to bear out a good testimony and not get too attached to earthly things. And yes, there are times there, when those within the church have confused preaching the gospel with preaching their own political views. Jesus in his ministry was not political. The Roman government of that time was an aggressive government that committed awful atrocities uh, as history has it recorded for us against its enemies and even against its own people. And yet it's remarkable how little Jesus and the rest of the New Testament had to say about Rome. Their primary objective, like the primary objective of the church, is to preach the good news of the gospel. And where that gospel rubs against the world, then we preach against the world. So the Bible instructs us about paying for taxes. First Peter chapter 2 says, Submit to the human institutions. Romans 13 says, Pay to all what is owed them. Luke 3, Collect no more than what you're authorized to do. And then briefly, we move to the second question, the second trick question. It's a theological question this time. If you can't get them with politics, you'll surely get them with theology. And so the, the religious authorities, they sent a group of Sadducees to Jesus. They attempted to trick Jesus with this question. The Sadducees, when they believed there was no resurrection, they were a conservative religious group of their day, and they made the Pharisees look progressive by comparison. The, the Sadducees based their theology, their doctrine, on the first five books of the Old Testament. And because they only held the first five books of the Torah, they rejected, namely, a belief in the resurrection, and secondly, they rejected the idea of angels. They thought those two things can't be supported by the first five books of the Bible. So, in many ways, their trick question to trick and trap Jesus is a ridiculous one. They assume that people in heaven will be like people on earth, that there will be marriage in heaven, and Jesus says that people will be something like angels in heaven. It doesn't mean that we will be exactly the same, but there will be some similarities. There won't be marriage in heaven like there is on earth, and then there will there be procreation or reproduction. This doesn't mean that you won't remember your spouse. Your earthly relationship with your spouse will be forgotten or will lose some of its meaning. Well, it won't be forgotten, but it could lose some of its meaning within heaven. How meaningful our relations are on earth will be unclear from Scripture. But we are to remember in terms of marriage that we are, we are the bride of Christ and our focus in heaven will be in Christ, not on our spouse. Heaven will be much more different than the Sadducees or we could expect. 
So the Sadducees, they want to know if a woman is married seven times. That was to do with the, the literal the law in, in the Torah. Uh, to whom would she be married in the resurrection? And yet the crazy thing is they themselves don't believe in the resurrection that they're talking about. It. And so they want to expose Jesus and what they view as his crazy teaching on the resurrection. Jesus in the Gospel of Mark has so far on three occasions taught them that he would rise again from the dead. And Jesus wasted no time in dealing with their hypothetical situation, but went directly to their underlying assumption that the resurrection of the dead was impossible. And Jesus clearly stated that the Sadducees were wrong about the resurrection for two reasons. Number one, he says, you don't know the scripture. And number two, he says, you don't know the power of God. So that is a reminder for us to read and to learn and to know the scriptures. We'll always be learning and to have trust and faith in God's power. The Sadducees, they were the self-proclaimed experts in the scriptures. They should have known better. They were the ones who were to study. They should have seen that there was evidence for the resurrection and yet the ultimate proof of the resurrection is not what Jesus had to say to the Sadducees the ultimate proof for them would happen a short time later when some of the followers of Jesus a few days later will discover his empty tomb the empty tomb of Jesus is the undeniable evidence of the certainty and the surety the resurrection of Christ that took place as he had predicted and as he had planned. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for the relevance of your holy word. We thank you Lord for the teaching it contains. We pray Father that we may see it in more than a Sunday lesson, but Lord that we may be able to take the truths that we encounter Sunday by Sunday and week by week and put them into practice in our daily living, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For our closing praise, let's turn to Mission Praise 689. 689, Thine be the glory.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace this day and forevermore.